Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Jack Baca, and you have signed in to the Village Church Worship for Sunday, April 25th, and we're happy to have you here with us wherever you are, whatever time it is. I'm glad you're here to worship. Let me remind you of just a couple things going on in the life of our church as we settle into worship. First of all, to note that we are going to be celebrating Undy Sunday. Yes, that's right, Undy Sunday. Now, Undy Sunday is actually going to happen the whole month of May, and we are inviting you to bring new underwear and socks for people of all ages, either to worship with you on Sunday mornings all through May at the church, or drop them off at the church office sometime during the week, or simply send in your check to support that ministry. We're going to be helping out our partners in ministry with New Day Urban Ministries in downtown San Diego. Also want to note that Chersty Atkins, our children's ministry director of the last several years, will be moving soon with her family to Idaho. And so we'll be saying farewell to Chersty and thanks for her ministry among us. We'll have a special celebration on Sunday, May 9th. There's other information about church life on our church website and also in the regular emails that we send every week, so be sure to pay attention to all the events and activities coming up in the life of the church. We're here, of course, to worship God, so let's focus our hearts and minds now using these ancient but timeless words from the 146th Psalm. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps them forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. Friends, let us worship God. the sure and certain promise of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, we can come before the presence of the living God to confess the ways in which we have sinned against God and one another, the ways in which we have broken the heart of God, the ways in which we need God's mercies and grace. Let us confess our sins using the prayer that is projected on your screen. 
in one voice, let us confess together. Gracious God, in the company of your people, we confess our sins to you. We have been angry and impatient, complaining about the faults of others and failing to see our own. We have been lazy and selfish, neglecting the interests of others and pursuing our own. We have been faithless and unworthy, ignoring the strength you offer and relying upon our own. God of mercy, you have promised to forgive those who truly repent. Help us to accept your forgiveness and dwell in us by your spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends and sisters and brothers in Christ, people of God, receive and believe, hear and trust in the good news of God for us in Jesus Christ, that God sent his son Jesus Christ for the life of the world. In Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension, you and I have been saved, you and I have been set free, you and I are now free to love God and to love one another as Christ loved us. Thanks be to God, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia, amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Because God has given us peace with him and with one another, let us share signs of God's peace and love with each other. I invite and encourage you to extend those signs of love and peace to those around you and indeed not only this day, but every single day, amen. I'm trading my sorrows and I'm trading my shame. Sickness, and I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed. Not corrupt, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the ghost, for his promise will endure, and his joy is gonna be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my pain I'm late
morning, Kids Village, and happy Sunday. Today we are closing out the month of April, and this morning we're going to be talking about a very special and unique lady named Abigail. In our story, we learn just how she brought peace into the situation that she was dealing with. Your word for this month, which is peace, means that you're more concerned about loving one another than being right and winning an argument. And this is exactly what Abigail demonstrates for us this morning. Your story comes from 1 Samuel 25, 1 through 35. So you can read this full story at home with your families, but I'm going to summarize it for us this morning. In our story, Abigail was married to a man who wasn't very nice, and he was getting into trouble with King David. Now, in this story, Abigail knew that King David and his men needed food. They were working really hard, and so Abigail decided to go and give them food. This made her husband really upset and it wasn't something that he wanted Abigail to do. Her husband wasn't doing the right thing and he really wasn't bringing peace into the situation where he could. He was prideful and he was more concerned about himself. Abigail took it upon herself to do what God felt like he was telling her to do and that proved out to be the right thing and God blessed her because of that. So we can be reminded in this story with Abigail that sometimes even when other people are not bringing peace into their families or into their friendships or into their schools, that we can be a person that brings in peace. Whenever you see those situations happening, we always need to go to God and say, okay, God, even though that person's responding this way, how can I respond? Because I want to honor and glorify you. We hope that this is encouraging for you all, and we will see you back here next week as we start the new month of May. Bye-bye. This world can be cold and bitter. It feels like we're in the dead of winter, waiting on something better. But am I really gonna hide forever, over and over again? I hear your voice in my head. Let your light shine, let your light shine for all to see and start a fire in my soul. And the flame make it grow, so there's no doubt or denying. A spark to start a whole place. It only takes a little faith. Let it start right here in this city. So these old walls will never be the same. Over and over again, I hear your voice in my head. They need to know I need to go. Spirit, won't you fall on my heart now? Start a fire in my soul. Fan the flame and make it grow. So there. Let it burn so badly Everyone around can see That it's you, that it's you that we need Start a fire in me You are the fire, you are the flame You are the light in the darkest day We have a hope, we bear your name We carry the news that you have come to say Fan the flame and make it grow So there's no doubt or denying Let it burn so brightly That everyone around can see That it's you, that it's you that we need Start a fire, start a fire in my soul Fan the flame and make it grow
Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us join our hearts in prayer. I will lead us in a pastoral prayer, hoping that I have captured the heart of God's people and then invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious God, deliverer, God of mercy and justice, Lord of grace and hope, we come before you today in gratitude and reflection. We are grateful for who you are, God, Lord of righteousness, whose anger will not remain forever. Our God, who sends out a savior for the world, even as we rejoice in your justice, we acknowledge that our world is still very broken, captive to hate, violent in thought, word, and deed. You send your very self in Jesus to lift up the brokenhearted, to give release to the captives, to proclaim the year of God's favor. You come in Holy Spirit power to transform our very being as followers of your Son. Lord, help us to walk humbly with you. Jesus, do a work in your church, building relationships across denominations, economics, politics, and doctrine. Do a work in this nation called the United States of America, where currently she is divided by fear, hate, anger, arrogance, attitude, and so many other barriers. How can this be, God? Have Christians who resided in this nation lost our way? Have our voices ceased to be raised? Have we adopted dishonorable views of others to promote ourselves or taken sides where none were intended? Have we forgotten to show the way to the cross, to walk alongside even those who would revile us? Have we neglected the least of these in our own pursuit of happiness? O oh Lord, let your work be about reconciliation in our homes, church, and the world. Let justice flow down, not for a brief moment, but each and every day. Help us in our work for ongoing justice and reconciliation. Father God, Guide us as we support those who serve, especially our peace officers, who serve justly. If we have ignored the work or care of those who do good, forgive us. Renew our care and support for those called to defend and protect. We pray against any bad intentions or malice on our part or on any in power. We pray against those who do evil even as they serve in authority. Let us name the sin and work to restore the sinner. Let us applaud and support those who work for righteousness. Let us uphold them and their role, holding them accountable to be and move and act as their call and service requires. Let us not lift up stones to throw at anyone, whether those incarcerated or those who enforce the law. Let us come alongside with Holy Spirit presence, showing them in word and deed the way of your son, Jesus the Prince of Peace. Let your love prevail and may we, as sinners redeemed by your gracious work, reflect your image of unconditional love and peace. In Jesus' name we pray, as he taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Greetings. Let us begin our time in the scriptures with a prayer for illumination. Please join me in prayer. O Lord, we pray that your light would pour over these pages and illumine these old, old words, that they would dance with newness in our hearts and minds, that we would be radiant in reflecting your word in our living and serving one another. Amen. And now a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? And now a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And a reading from the letter to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. The Word of the Lord. I'd like to extend a special welcome in our worship today to my colleague in ministry who's here with me, Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, as we call him, or Francesco, as he would have been called in Italy, died on my birthday, October 3rd, 1226, 730 years before I was born. But I call him a colleague in ministry because of our shared sense of what following Jesus is all about. You know a lot about St. Francis, probably because you know the prayer that is attributed to him that goes this way. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. 
A way that you and I might summarize that prayer and a way that we might summarize the life and ministry of Francis is by saying that it's all about caring for others. That's what I want to talk about today. That's why I've welcomed Francis to share the pulpit with me today. We are working our way through a series of sermons that focus on the way of Jesus in a wayward world, because we know that the world does not always do things the way Jesus would do them. That's why Jesus came to save the world and to show the world another way. The Apostle Paul was thinking of that same thing as he was sharing with the church in Rome about the way of Jesus. He was thinking about that as he said to them to do this, to contribute to the needs of the saints, to extend hospitality to strangers. This pillar of our identity as Christians, as people who follow Jesus. This focus in our entire way of thinking about who we are and who we are meant to be is actually rooted in the history of God's people. You'll remember in the story of the Old Testament that God came to Abraham with a great plan for Abraham's life and all of Abraham's family after him. That family grew and flourished, but then they found themselves enslaved in Egypt and then freed under Moses' leadership and then wandering for a time in the wilderness. In all of those experiences, the people of God experienced God's care. And even as they entered the Holy Land to make it their own, They learned that God cared for them. They had been refugees. They had been immigrants. They had been foreigners seeking a better life. Then they became the settled establishment. But in all of that, they remembered God's care for them. And they began to uphold as one of the ideals of their faith, This concept that they were meant to care for those both within their community and those outside their community. To care for the widow and the orphan and the foreigner among them. As the Jews began to learn more about who they were based on who God was and what God had created for them, they learned that caring for others is within the essence of the character of God himself. God is the God who cares for us. God is the God who takes care of all of his children in all of his creation. He creates us, first of all, then he provides for our needs, and he gives to all, regardless of who they are, where they live, what they look like, the language that they speak. God cares for all of his human children. God cares for all of his creation. Now, let's remember that story and that experience over hundreds and hundreds of years as background, if you will, to the three scripture passages that were read for us a moment ago. In the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, we hear that God despises empty, ritualistic religion. God is not interested in the things that we say to him in and of themselves. God is not interested in the different rituals or practices that we engage before him in worship in and of themselves. He is interested in them only as they lead us into changed lives. God is interested in true worship that leads to true life, a life of loving and serving others. What does God want from us? 
Certainly he wants us to pray. Certainly he wants us to worship. But all of that is for the purpose of our learning how to live in the way that he taught, learning how to live in a way that is consistent with his own character and being, in a way that looses the bonds of injustice, that undoes the thongs of the yoke, that shares bread, that houses the homeless, that covers the naked, that cares for our own kin and does not disregard them. That is what God was saying through Isaiah to his people. That theme was so strong that it was picked up in Jesus' own ministry. Jesus, who also had no use for empty ritualistic religion. Jesus wanted true worship from us, worship that leads to caring for others. Now, Jesus worshiped regularly, certainly. He read scripture, he prayed, he went to the temple to celebrate with God. But that was not all Jesus did. That's not all that Jesus' people do. Jesus said what God wants us to do then, because of our worship, because of what we learn about God and what we know of God's character and what that means for us, then we will feed the hungry. We will give water to the thirsty. We will welcome the stranger. We will visit those who are imprisoned. All of that is why Paul then would write to the Romans that what God wants from us is our true spiritual worship. Paul never really gave directions for how the early church was supposed to gather together, what hymns they were to sing, or what kind of bulletin they were to use, or what the pastors were supposed to wear, or even whether or not people should wear masks and distance themselves from each other. No, what Paul said is that what God wants from us is true spiritual worship that leads toward our transformation that leads towards our becoming conformed to the image and the example of Jesus, not the image and example given by the wayward world. And so Paul gave many examples of what that transformed life looks like. Among them, those that we're focusing on today. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Notice that Paul wants to be sure that we understand that we're taking care of those within the community of faith. That's who the saints were in Paul's day. That's what early Christians called themselves. Saints, not because they were special, not because they were better than anybody else, but because they had been called by God into a fellowship with God, into a community with each other, then to be an example and a witness and service to the rest of the world. Take care of the church, Paul says. Take care of those in the family of faith. But that's not all. Then we extend hospitality to strangers. We welcome others into the community. We serve others who are part of the broader community in which we live. Christians have always done that. Christians still do. Think about some of the greatest heroes of Christian faith. Francis of Assisi, now, sometimes folks focus on Francis because he was so attuned to God's nature, right? To the animals and the birds and the flowers. This Francis is holding a couple of birds, and he's got some of the flowers around him from our own garden here at my home. But that's not all that Francis was about. Francis wasn't just a, a nature lover. Francis loved humanity. Francis took a vow of poverty so that he could serve others. And not just Francis. Think about some of the other great heroes. Maybe Teresa of Calcutta, or Schweitzer of Africa, or even Father Joe of San Diego. Here's the point. The Judeo-Christian view of life is pointed towards selfless service for others. And that value that Western Christian value, if you will, is ingrained in who we are in this country. 
I don't have one of these statues, but it's a statue that I only need mention, and you'll know the one I'm talking about. Not a statue of St. Francis, but a statue of liberty. The statue given by France to the United States of America that now stands in New York Harbor. Some of you will remember that there's a poem inscribed on the base of that statue. It was written by a young Jewish woman named Emma Lazarus. Emma was a descendant of Sephardic Jews who had immigrated from Portugal around the time of the United States Revolution. By the time Emma was born, her family had been in the United States for a hundred years or so. In the 1880s, as Emma saw immigrants continuing to come into the United States, especially Jewish immigrants from Russia who were experiencing religious and cultural persecution at the hands of the Russian people, she wrote one of many poems, and this particular poem then was chosen to be inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. The title of it is The New Colossus. Let me read it for you. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Let's talk about what it means, how it actually works itself out in your life and my life, to be part of a tradition and to share a faith and to seek after a life of learning from and living like Jesus, our Master. What's involved in this business of caring for others? Well, let's admit there are lots of roadblocks, there are lots of problems, and we have lots of excuses. Sometimes we say to others who might need something that we could give, well, I'm sorry, you deserve what you've gotten. We say that, don't we? Sometimes we say, you know, I know you need something, but I've worked hard for what I've got, and I'm going to keep it for myself. Sometimes we say, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to give. That's true. Sometimes we can't fill the need of others. Sometimes we say, I really don't know how to give. How can I help? It can be difficult. It can be complicated. Sometimes we try to help and it backfires or it doesn't work. And we get jaded. We get tired. Sometimes we say, you know, we can't care for everyone. We can't take care of everything. Sure enough, that's true. Sometimes we say, I'm afraid of being taken advantage of. Sometimes we say, this is not my problem. These are not my people. Those are some of the things that I've experienced in myself. Maybe there have been others in your experience. Roadblocks and excuses and problems. When we try to answer that call to care, for others, and to share with others. But that's not the only story. Jesus didn't say, I know there are problems, I know you have excuses, let's just forget about all of it. No. What did he say? He said we are meant to care for others, to share with others. 
And so how do we do that? Well, again, in my own life, let me give you some ideas, some experiences. Number one, I think we need to realize and simply admit that we cannot do everything. There's only one Savior of the whole world, and it's not you, and it's not me. It's Jesus. You and I cannot save the whole world, true enough, but we can do something. I'm fond of saying, don't do what you can't do, but do what you can. Do what you can. Do what God gives you to do, with whom he puts into your life, and with what he gives into your life. I've learned sometimes that it's very helpful to pick out maybe one place, one situation, one particular need to work on for the sake of others. You can't give to everybody in every way at all times, but what can you do? I've been blessed by the example of so many people in my life and people in the life of our church now, maybe who focus on a particular region of the world. They focus on China. They focus on Africa. They focus on downtown San Diego. Or maybe they focus on a particular question, maybe the question of hunger, maybe the question of mental illness, maybe the question of, of human trafficking. Pick out one place, one thing that you're going to really engage and do in the world, and then start. Another thing you have to do, of course, is to ask God to make you less selfish, <laughs> You have to say, God, you know, I have all my excuses, all my reasons, all my problems, but I know you want something better for me. So make me to learn to follow, to learn to care. And then go into that place where there is the pain and suffering of other people. This is perhaps the best thing that I've ever learned that the way to learn how to care for others is to go to where others are, go into their lives, their real lives, where they live and what they face and what they do. And you'll learn to care more and share more. Several years ago now, I had the chance to go to visit El Salvador. Our little group stayed in a nice hotel in San Salvador, the capital city, but one day we were taken in a bus out into the countryside, and there we met a family of five who lived in a two-room house. They called it a house. You and I have nicer storage sheds. One of the little girls in the family was so proud to show to us that day her toys or maybe I should say her toy, a doll that she still kept in its original box and obviously rarely if ever got out in order to keep it nice, her one toy. There was no electricity in that two-room house. There was no running water in that two-room house. The family had to go downhill about 300 yards to a nearby stream and then bring water up the hill in buckets. We shared a meal with that family that day, box lunches of fried chicken that we had brought in for ourselves to share with them, and we sat and ate with them outside around the campfire where they cooked their meals, and then at the end of the meal, we were asked to take all of our chicken bones and the scraps from our meal, put them carefully back in the box, and then hand it over to the family, because later we were told. The family would take our chicken bones and use them to make soup. I've never forgotten that family. I never will. They are part of the human family that I'm called to serve and with whom I'm called to share. What about you? Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then the Lord will answer them, truly I tell you. 
Just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us join together and affirm our faith. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Amen. I have no way of knowing for sure, but I suspect that most people in their gardens do not have statues of most of the known figures of Christian history or other history. I suspect that maybe if you have a statue of anyone in your garden, it might be someone like San Francisco here, Francesco. 
The one who through his selfless life became a model for all of us. The one who modeled his own life after Jesus. The one who gave it all for us. Regardless of what's in your garden, let me ask you what's in your heart. And then what's in your life? What's in the legacy that you are building to leave? Is it a life of giving for the sake of others? It is, is it a life of, of sharing with others? Is it a life of acting according to the character and being of God who stamped his image in you? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace today and always. Amen. Music